this is the brief agenda for today. We are going to talk about international VAT in general. Then we are going to talk about the basics of international VAT. That's a lot of slides, of course, but I did not want to put everything on the agenda. And then we are going to talk about the VAT risks and opportunities. VAT, it's VAT, GST, whatever it's named in a country, it now applies in more than 160 countries worldwide. It's not the same as sales tax. We all know that sales tax is being charged on the last transaction to the end consumer. VAT is charged on every transaction in the supply chain. It's the global, the third most important source of income for governments behind social contributions and income taxes. So it's a very important tax. One other interesting thing about VAT is that the laws and regulations are constantly changing. So you have to keep up with what is going on. Indirect taxes are typically, typically based on trade flows. It does not depend on income. It does not depend on profits. So changes in the way a company is doing business could also influence the VAT position of that company. These changes in taxes, so if something changes for the company, but also something changes in the VAT, it could influence the supply chains of the company, the locations where the activities are carried out, but also the costs of the finished products. Because if you did not account for VAT in your calculations, the cost could rise in the end if you did have to pay VAT, for example, if something goes wrong, you did not take care of it in advance, VAT could become a cost for your business, which is not, of course, the ideal VAT. Delivery routes could be an influence timing as well. More and more companies also recognize that an effective management of indirect taxes is essential to support the growth of the company. But this is a challenge. We, in our daily practice, we see that international companies are constantly struggling with what is going on in VAT. They want to move their uh, trade to another country or they want to move their manufacturing to another country. They want to move how the goods flow. They want to do it by train. They want to do it by plane, whatever. It is all of influence for the VAT. It's all interesting to see what happens. But there is one other thing. The tax authorities in every country are also very aware of the VAT that comes across. They want to collect as much VAT, of course, as possible and are therefore developing their methods of checking auditing uh, companies. Like in many countries already, um, data need to be provided to the tax authorities. Not only a VAT return is filed, but also data need to be provided or invoices need to be provided on a very quickly basis so that the tax authorities can check what is going on and whether everything goes right for the VAT. So that's very important to keep in mind that if you change something in a flow of goods in a company, you have to think of the VAT in advance, preferably. How does the VAT work? It's a multi-stage tax, which I already mentioned, on consumption that applies on the supply of goods and services. The end consumer, this person here, has to carry the burden. Businesses are treated as taxpayers, so the manufacturer, the wholesaler and the retailer are all being treated as taxpayers. They have to pay the VAT to the tax authorities. They file VAT returns. So for governments, it's highly cost effective because the uh, companies have to file the VAT return. They are reporting what they have to pay to the tax authorities and the tax authorities will check it afterwards. But it's very important for companies that the VAT returns they file are 100% accurate. So it's a heavy burden. How does it work? In this situation, you can see that the manufacturer is selling goods to the wholesaler. The manufacturer issues an invoice of 80 plus 20 euros VAT or dollars, whatever you want. The manufacturer pays the VAT which he collects from the wholesaler to the Dutch tax authorities or to the tax authorities. The wholesaler then can reclaim the VAT and it goes on and on and on. Here in the end, the consumer pays 120 plus 30 VAT. The retailer pays it to the tax authorities, but the consumer cannot ask the VAT back. This is the end station. He has to carry the burden of the VAT. Is that clear to everyone? 
Does anyone have questions about this? No? Good. Then we go on with the next slide. Then who is this taxable person? It's any person who independently carries out in any place, any economic activity, whatever the purpose or result of that activity. So you do not have to make a profit to become a taxpayer or a taxable person for VAT. And when does it start? It all starts with the first business activity. So when you start, when you are making a plan about what will your activities be, you buy a laptop, you already are a taxpayer, for a taxable person from a VAT perspective. So it starts very soon. It also ends at the final business activities. It could be that a company is being terminated, but that it will receive an invoice three months later for the advisory costs made or whatever. VAT charge on that invoice could still be deductible. So that's why companies are being deregistered with the tax authorities often at a later stage than when they are, for example, already terminated. So keep that in mind. It's very important. As we already saw, VAT taxes goods and services. We have to make a distinction in what these are. First, let's start with the goods. The goods, what is it? The supply of goods is the transfer of the right to dispose of a tangible property as an owner. So for example, if you are going to buy a book here in the store, that's the supply of goods for VAT. What is the service? That's actually anything which is not a supply of goods. So if I'm buying an e-book, that's a service. I'm not really receiving something in my hand, so I could consider that as a service. Is that clear? Great. Let's start with the VAT treatment of services. I made this nice schedule, and I'm starting with the main rules, because we, of course, have main rules and exceptions. And for this main rule, first you have to determine whether your customer is in a business so not a company or a consumer, a private individual like you and me, guys. If your customer is not a business, you have to, the main rule says, okay, this service is subject to VAT in the country where the customer is established. If your customer is a private individual, the main rule says, the service is subject to VAT in the country where the supplier, the service provider is established. So if we are going to look at this schedule, and we start here at the left, we have a Dutch supplier. The customer is established in the Netherlands, and it's not a business. What is the rule? Business to business, subject to VAT in? Sorry? Where customers Yeah, good. So in the Netherlands, so Dutch VAT should be charged. Then we have the B2C rule. What's the rule for VAT? Subject to VAT in the country of? Good, good. So also Dutch VAT. But now we make it a little bit more difficult. We have a customer in another EU country than the Netherlands. It's B2B. Main rule service. Service subject to VAT in the country of? So the, the establishment of the customer. Yeah, correct. So the service is subject to VAT in the other EU country. The EU implemented a simplification regulation so that um, this supplier, does, Dutch supplier, does not have to register for VAT in that other EU country, but the VAT can be reverse charged. So no VAT will be charged by the Dutch supplier here. They will re reverse charge the VAT and the, the customer has to uh, calculate the VAT amount due and report it in its fat return. What if this uh, customer in another EU country is a private individual. B2C, subject to VAT in the country of? Good. So Dutch VAT will be charged. Now the customer is established in Switzerland, non-EU country. How does the rule work then? B2B, service subject to VAT in the country of establishment, you just saw. So not subject to VAT in Europe. And what we often say then is out of scope. No EU VAT is due. Is that clear? I see faces going like this. Some questioning looks. Um, 
then the B2C service subject to VAT in the country of the supplier. So Dutch VAT should be charged. But these are only main world services. And of course, I made a case so that you can um, practice. MHA, where we are now, so the UK establishment of Baker Tully International, provides an advisory service to a US company. What are the VAT consequences? Sorry? Out of scope of EU VAT. Yeah, that's correct. Is that clear? Good. Then the second one, Baker Tilly in the US provides an advisory service to a company established in Germany. What will happen? They will charge on imported services. Very good. Baker Tilly in the US will not mention anything of VAT or reverse charge or whatever on its invoices because they don't have to. The German company needs to be aware that if they receive a, an invoice like this, that they have to report VAT in their VAT return as payable, reverse charge VAT, report it as payable if they have the right to deduct VAT, also report it as refundable on balance, no VAT is due. But it needs to be reported. This is one of the mistakes that is made very often in practice. And it's a huge problem if this company does not have the right to deduct input VAT. For example, if, a if this is a hospital, they cannot ask VAT black, reclaim VAT. They have to pay the VAT. We have seen many cases where hospitals did not report this VAT as payable VAT. So be aware of these incoming invoices on which a reverse charge mechanism is applicable. Then the main rule for services, of course, has some exceptions. A few important ones. Services regarding immovable property, like the rent of office space or the rent of a hotel room. These services are subject to VAT where that immovable property is situated. So if I rent a hotel room here in London, that service is subject to VAT here in the UK. So UK VAT will be charged. It doesn't matter where I'm established whether I'm a company or not. Another exception is admission to events. So if I host an event like a conference or in some countries even a training like this is subject to VAT in the country where the training or conference is being held. And every EU country unfortunately has its own yeah, regulations in order to determine what is an admission to an event or not. If, for example, this training session would be held in the Netherlands, we would argue it's not subject to VAT in the Netherlands because it's not admission, it's a main role service participating to a training. There could be other countries where they could say, well, no, this is admission to an event. It's not participating to a training. So the line is very thin. Be aware of that. And then we have an important one, a very popular one, e-services, and then especially B2C e-services. What are e-services? Our, these are electronic services. So for example, if you sell online games or if you sell apps, these services are subject to VAT in the country of the customer, both B2B and B2C. And it gets interesting when it's B2C because VAT is due then in the country where your customer lives. So if you buy an app online, you sell an app online, you need to determine where does this customer of mine live. And of the country where he lives, you need to charge him VAT. Anybody ever dealt with that problem? Because it's a huge problem. How should you determine where your customer lives? There are many, um, um, how do you say it, uh, tips given by the EU, like for example the IP address, or its banking details, that could help you determine where your customer is established and from which country you should charge the local VAT. Besides that you know, need to know where your customer lives, 
You also need to know, for example, the VAT rate of the country. If you have determined, okay, he lives in France, you also need to know the correct VAT rate of France. Those, so those, these are all practical problems that will arise when you supply e-services. We have a customer and they are established in the US and they sell online games to uh, private individuals and apparently very popular online games. They, EU, they have already uh, dealt with everything. They file uh, returns, which I will just uh, show you with, through the MOS system. I will explain it later on. But they also sell these games in Australia, in South Africa, in Russia, in Switzerland. And also these countries, these non-EU countries, charge VAT on the supply of online services. So we are now in the process of registering this client in Russia, in Norway, and let me see, in New Zealand, in South Korea, in Switzerland, in Taiwan, in Australia. So be aware that also non-EU countries uh, will charge VA VAT or GST or whatever on these type of services. So if you have a client who is dealing with this, also think outside the EU or think in the EU if you are established outside the EU, of course. And um, yeah, that's a, really a challenge. Then how does the EU system work? The old system was that if you sell an app to a German customer, to a French customer and whatever, you need to file uh, VAT returns in every country. So you need to get a VAT number and file local VAT returns. That's quite complex because you need to get all the VAT numbers. That takes a lot of time. And then you also need to file local VAT returns with the local requirements, with the local filing deadlines, with the local payment deadlines, etc., etc. To make that a less complicated, the EU introduced the MOS system, mini one-stop shop system. This means that you can register in one EU country. In this example, it's the Netherlands. You charge all the local VAT, so you charge German VAT, you charge the Swedish VAT, you charge the Italian VAT to your customers, they pay it to you, and you pay it in one return, return it's called MOS return. You file the MOS return, you pay that, all that VAT to the Dutch tax authorities, and based on your MOS return, they will pay the VAT due per country to every country. So then you do not need these VAT registrations in these countries, and you do not need to file VAT returns in all these countries. Is it for all the countries, even uh, for those who do not use euro as their currency? For all the 28 EU countries. What happens with the foreign exchange? Uh, yeah, there are special. Yeah. 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 There is special regulation. I believe that you need to report it in the MOS return in the local currency. So in the local currency of the country to which it will be paid, because you will also get paid in that local currency. But in your administration, it also needs to be good. So if you have an administration in euros and you're going to apply different exchange rates, yeah, there could become a difference. So that's a hell of a job. Yeah. Is this clear? Oh yeah, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the business case. I already uh, explained it a little bit. So they sell online games to customers living in the EU, Norway and other countries, and they need to register in these countries. So we go to the next slide. Goods. Who deals a lot with the supplies of goods by its customers? Yeah, 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 very good. Um, yeah, well, as we already told, it, it's the transfer of the right to dispose of a tangible property as an owner. When is it taxable? When the ownership transfers. Um, and then, where is it subject to VAT? And that's uh, often a very um, difficult question. And the answer is always follow the flow of the goods. So it's a completely different regulation than the regulation for services, where you are going to check the service and where's your customer established, etc. For goods, you always need to follow the flow of the goods. If goods are transported, VAT is due in the country where the transport starts. In other situations, in principle, the location of the moment of supply of the goods. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule, uh, distance sales, and I will speak about that later on. Distance sales are sales to private individuals via a web shop. As I already mentioned, in order to determine where the supply is subject to VAT, you need to determine the place of supply. There are different types of supplies of goods for VAT purposes. 
you have the exports, so goods sent from an EU country to a non-EU country. You have the imports, goods coming from a non-EU country to an EU country. Then you have intra-community supplies of goods. Goods are sent from one EU country to another EU country. You also have intra-community acquisitions, so goods are sent from one EU country to another EU country and you report the acquisition of the goods. And we also have local supplies of goods. Let's start with the import. That's actually the first one where the VAT starts with. Goods come from a non-EU country to an EU country. It's important to remember that everybody who imports goods in the EU needs to pay VAT in the country of import. So also private individuals like you and me. Unless your package is uh, worth uh, 22 euros or less, then you do not pay import VAT. But if it's, more, if it's worth more, you have to pay import VAT. When is the import taxable? At the moment of import. And um, if you are a company and you're importing goods, millions of millions of euros of goods are being imported, and you have to pay VAT at the moment of import, and you can reclaim it back at a later stage, that could, of course, um, cause a cash flow disadvantage because you have to pre-finance VAT, which you will claim back at a later stage. And in between, that could be four months. So in these four months, your cash is gone. Several EU countries implemented regulation to um, make sure that that cash flow disadvantage does not happen. I will discuss the um, regulation the Netherlands have. It's called an import VAT deferment license. You import goods, and here you have the, the, the first line is the one where you don't have a license. So you pay the import VAT, then after four months you can reclaim it, then through your VAT return, then the Dutch tax authorities are going to check your VAT return, and then if you're lucky, you get your VAT back within one month after you filed it, and then you have your import VAT back. So there could be a period of five months in between it. There is a special regulation which is called an import VAT deferment license. If you have that license, you do not have to pay VAT on the moment of import, but the payment of VAT is shifted to the moment you file your VAT return. In your VAT return, you include the VAT you have to pay for the import, but since you can also deduct it, so reclaim it, you also include that in your VAT return. So on balance, it's zero. No pre-financing. You report it in your VAT return and you do not miss that cash for five months. Is this clear? Are there any restrictions in terms of the license? Is that thresholds? Uh, no thresholds. Any company established in the Netherlands can. And any foreign company can apply for a license as well, as long as they appoint a fiscal rep. Mm -hmm. so yeah. And this should be someone independent or an employee? Uh, no, this is a, in a Dutch established company who can act as a fiscal representative. For example, our firm has a separate uh, BV for that mm -hmm. and they act as a general fiscal rep. Okay. Yeah. And the general fiscal rep applies then for a VAT number and an Article 23 license. So it's like a sort of domiciliation services with yeah. regard to external Yeah, funds. yeah, yeah. But in that way, they do not have to pre-finance. We have one very big multinational as a client and they import for 20 million or 30 million per month. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they cannot miss, miss that kind of cash, for example. And how long does it take to obtain the license? Uh, if all the information is complete, uh, one, two weeks. It depends on whether the tax authorities are working and not on holiday and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that happens. Seriously. Um, okay. And then um, we are going to talk about the supplies of goods. We now discuss the imports. We now have the following supplies. We have a B2B supply, so business to business. Goods stay in one EU country, so goods do not leave the, that EU country. Follow the flow of the goods. That supply is subject to VAT in the country where the goods are. Germany in this case. So German VAT should be charged. Clear? Good. Then we make it a little bit more difficult. We have a B2B supply, and the goods stay in that country. You can see it here, they stay in the Netherlands. Um, but the supplier is a German company. So a German company has goods in a warehouse in the Netherlands and sells it to a Dutch entity. Some EU countries have regulation in place, 
where this German company does not have to register in the Netherlands because you would say, it is correct, this supply is subject to VAT in the Netherlands. So the German company would have to charge Dutch VAT. In order to simplify that, for example, the Netherlands, but also other countries have implemented a, a rule which says, okay, in this type of situation where your customer is established in the Netherlands, you are not, you may reverse charge the VAT. So you do not charge VAT. The VAT is reverse charged to the Dutch customer. He has to calculate the VAT amount due, can ask it back in his VAT return, and then on balance in zero. Now another interesting one, an interesting one that goes wrong a lot because the conditions are not met. This is a B2B supply, goods go from one EU country to another EU country and then we always say okay it's subject to 0% uh, VAT or an exemption with the right of deduction. That's true if the goods go from one EU country to another EU country and the goods are subject to VAT, so to an intra-community acquisition in the country of arrival. These are the conditions, but how do you prove that? Because you need to prove that you, meet these, that you met these conditions. What do you think for the first one? How do you prove that the goods left, in this case, the Netherlands and went to Italy? Very good. And then transport documents, which are signed for receipt. Yeah. This multinational client where I'm talking about, it's a hell of a job to get these transport documents. We ask for a sample of the transport documents and they need to get it from logistics service providers, etc., etc. and we still haven't got it after one year. And if we get it, we need to check whether these are correct, whether these are indeed signed for receipt. If they are not signed for receipt, the tax authorities will uh, decline that document as proof and if you cannot prove that the goods indeed were received by the Italian customer they could argue and say okay well then you were 21% VAT was due and you cannot recharge it to your customer so that's your own cost then so it's a very important one this one and what do you need do you think in order to prove that the goods are subject to VAT and that the intra-community acquisition is reported in the country of arrival what would be the proof for that Yeah, the EU determined that it is sufficient that you get the valid VAT number of your customer. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you always need to check that uh, number. If you have a new customer, check it. Check it after a couple of months again. Uh, you can check it on the VIS website of the EU. If that website says, okay, the, the number is valid, PDF that, uh, that result and, and uh, store it. So that you know that at the moment you supply the goods, the VAT number was valid. But what could be the complications in the daily practice? Anybody aware of that? We already mentioned the proof of transport. What could also be a complication? That the VAT number is not valid, we already mentioned that. One interesting one is, for example, that the customer picks up the goods. If a customer picks up the goods, you do not arrange the transport, how do you know that he went to Italy? That he didn't stay in the Netherlands? That Dutch VAT wasn't due? You cannot prove that, so there's additional documentation required as proof if a customer picks up the goods, for example. Other um, complications could be that you receive incorrect invoices. If you receive an incorrect invoice, if you buy goods and these goods come from Italy to the Netherlands. You need to report the acquisition in the Netherlands, so you have to report the VAT due and the VAT refundable. You can only reclaim VAT in your VAT return if you have a correct invoice. So an invoice that meets with the invoice requirements. If you do not have that, the Dutch tax authorities and the other tax authorities in countries could argue the deduction of the input VAT. So it's an important one. Did I skip one? Oh yeah, the acquisition of the goods not reported, that happens also, that, that you send an invoice and that you send the goods and that you have the transport document and that you have the VAT number, but that your customer does not report the acquisition. Then you immediately get a mismatch between what you reported in your country of start of transport of the goods 
with the country of arrival of the goods. And you get a letter from the tax authorities to explain the difference. So these are complications in daily practice. Then another one. This is the export one. B2B supply of goods. Goods go from the Netherlands yeah, to the US. Zero rate is applicable. Also in this situation, you need to, uh, need to prove the application of the zero rate. What you must remember is for VAT, if you charge the general rate, often there is no need to prove transport, stuff like that. But if you are going to charge another rate than the general rate, so a zero rate, there is more into that. Because you need to prove that in this case, for example, the goods left the Netherlands. How would you do that? Yeah, that's correct. If goods leave the EU, uh, that needs to be reported at customs. So you get, uh, once they are s sent out to EU, you get a confirmation from the customs authorities of that country, uh, which proves that the goods indeed left that EU country. Anybody, any questions about this? You are thinking, go, keep on, keep on, then we're done earlier, earlier. Okay, here we go. EU distance selling regulation. If a business is selling goods to a private individual um, and he is sending these goods to uh, the country where that private individual is living, in principle here, a good is sold to, from the Netherlands to Germany, the good is sent there. In principle, Dutch VAT is due. Dutch VAT should be charged. But there is a threshold, a yearly threshold. If the web shop is going very well, and in one year they sell for more than 100,000 euros, for example, in August, they breach the threshold of 100,000 euros. As of the moment that they reach that threshold, German VAT is due by the web shop. So as of that moment, they need to register, the Dutch company needs to register for VAT in Germany and charge German VAT to its customers. If you do this a lot, like the web shop of our colleague over there, then you need to register in many EU countries. We have an Australian client who has a warehouse in the Netherlands and has registrations in 12 EU countries. You can imagine that it is a hell of a job to register them, because every EU country wants other documents, etc., etc. Yeah, you know it. And uh, then also file the VAT returns in these countries with their own uh, deadlines for filing, their own deadlines for paying, etc., etc. And then there's one important remark. If your customer is selling goods through a marketplace like Amazon, Amazon is not responsible for the VAT. Your customer is. The company who sells the goods to the customer, he is responsible for the VAT. So if he breaches the thresholds in these EU countries, not Amazon, but the company, your customer, needs to register in the EU countries. Here is the example. Company established in the US, selling electronic devices such as blenders to consumers and businesses. The stock comes by sea uh, from China to uh, the Netherlands. It's there stored in a warehouse of a third party and then once product is sold, so when, uh, when somebody is buying a product for their website, the product is packed and transported to the consumer within 24 to 48 hours. Does this US company have to do anything with VAT in Europe? Already before that. Yes. Because what they do is they, they, they Stock comes from China to the Netherlands. It's imported here in the Netherlands. So it's stored here in the Netherlands. At the moment of import, VAT is charged. Okay, you do not have to register for import VAT. You can reclaim that through refund request. But since it's imported here, these are free goods. As of the moment you are going to sell these goods to customers, you have to uh, report these sales in VAT returns. So at the moment, they started selling from the Netherlands to customers in the Netherlands, in the UK, in France, in Italy, in Poland, in Spain, wherever. They needed to charge VAT. Or not if it's a business, but let's focus on the private individuals. At the moment they breached the thresholds, because they did, they needed to register in all the EU countries and then charge the local VAT. And 
it's not only the VAT returns, but what I already mentioned, filing payment deadlines, VAT rates, what VAT rate is applicable on your product in that country. That all needs to be determined, but also captured by your system. Your administrative system, which records these sales, should also capture all these sales, should also check uh, whether you breach a threshold in a country or not this year, or it will be maybe next year or whatever. So that's a lot of, um, that's a challenge, a lot of complications. So there are some tips. First one, make sure that your systems are in place to capture all the right information regarding the sales. The second one, include your delivery shipping costs in the prices, because they also count. Keep up to date with the registrations, because if you register too late, that could, uh, the tax authorities in the countries could impose penalties for late registration, late filings. Uh, for example, in Italy, it could take more than, uh, let's say more than five months, let's say it could take a year if you're not lucky. Um, if VAT is already due in that period, you will need to pay it to the Italian tax authorities and they could impose penalties for paying it too late to them. Know which VAT uh, rates are applicable. Here you have the VAT registration, which I already mentioned. And one other very important thing is that if you have this web shop and sell these goods to private individuals and you breach this threshold, so the distance selling regulation becomes applicable, you also have to issue invoices to these private individuals, which comply with the invoice requirements of the country of arrival of the goods, so the customer's country. A lot of complications as you can imagine. I'm going to skip this one. Yeah, okay. If um, VAT is charged and you are obliged to file a VAT return, so if you do uh, supplies from the Netherlands, uh, B2B, B2C, whatever, you can reclaim that VAT, that local VAT in, for example, the Dutch VAT return. If you stay for one night a year in a hotel in London, you cannot reclaim UK VAT in a Dutch VAT return. So that needs to go in another way. If you're established in an EU country, which we are, we are established in the Netherlands, for example, we stayed here in the hotel, it was all for business purposes, we can reclaim the VAT through an EU VAT refund request. We often see that foreign VAT is included in local VAT returns. So German VAT in a France VAT return, etc., etc. Be aware that's not allowed. You have to file this request. This refund request needs to be submitted ultimately on the 30th of September of the year following the year in which the VAT was charged. So the deadline is approaching. If you're established in a non-EU country and you're not required to register for VAT in the country, so for example, if you import goods uh, in the Netherlands, uh, import VAT is charged. If you then sell the goods to a Dutch entity, we saw that then a reverse charge mechanism is applicable, so you do not need to charge VAT. So you do not need to have to file a VAT return, you are not allowed to. You can reclaim that input VAT on the import through a uh, refund request on paper. That needs to be filed before uh, 1st of July of the year following the year in which the VAT return of the VAT was charged. So you have quite some time to, f to file these uh, requests. You can also do it uh, uh, sooner. So for example, if it's charged in Q1, you can file uh, a refund request in Q2. That's no problem. As you saw, VAT is quite complicated especially, for example, for the distance sales. And since that is a booming market, the EU also noticed that. So they, want, uh, they published the VAT action plan last year. They are still discussing it. It's still not finalized. It could till, still take a lot of years to finalize it, if it will be finalized. But they want to simplify the, the, the rules, as you can see. What they also want to do is, for example, remove the import VAT exemption for small shipments. If you import goods, VAT is always due, that's what I mentioned, unless the value of the goods is less than 22 euros. No import VAT is due. That means that non-EU suppliers, like a Chinese supplier, has an advantage uh, 
I do not know how I have to say that in English, but has an advantage and an EU supplier does not. Because if an EU supplier supplies goods to a private individual, they always need to charge VAT. This Chinese supplier does not, if it's less than 22 euros. We are not happy with that as EU suppliers, so the EU is talking about removing that VAT exemption for small shipments. Why they are also talking about, and I assume that that will be implemented, is that they will also implement this one-stop shop system for e-commerce sales, so for web shop sales, which we discussed. For now, the current web shop sales, you need to register in all these EU countries. Get, file local VAT returns, and they are talking about implementing this one-stop shop. So register in one EU country, collect all the foreign VAT, pay it to the tax authorities in that one EU country, and that tax authorities will pay it to all the countries where the VAT was due. So that would prevent uh, registrations in all the countries and lo filing local VAT returns in all these countries. Then, there's one other thing which I would like to discuss. Um, we are all used to uh, file VAT returns uh, based on the, the figures of the client, etc., etc. But other countries are or have already implemented other ways of providing information to the tax authorities. And I understood there's somebody here from Mexico. Yes. Hi. Do you, would you like to explain what is happening in Mexico? How do companies there provide the information to the Mexican tax authorities? Instead of filing VAT returns, they need to provide invoices or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, they only send an electronic uh, invoice. Yeah. The Mexican government carry it and they have a database. Yeah. It's too easy for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also for import and export in yeah. Mexico and the US. Mm -hmm. It works that way. So mm -hmm. It's too easy now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the Mexican tax authorities can then check these invoices already. No paper invoices are sent anymore. Uh, no. Well, no. If you want, you can have it. But yeah. It's all electronic. They uh, have uh, the only firm. Yeah. 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 They have all that information. Yeah. So you see, the Mexican tax authorities have every invoice. Yeah. And Ukrainian as well. Ah, so here, yeah. Free. Invoices within 15 days. So, so for the uh, for invoices for the first half of June should be filed before 30th of June. Wow. And going forward, yeah. the VAT reporting, the calculations of obligation is done monthly. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, you need also to pay VAT to register your obligation in a special account. Yeah. And everything is done electronically. And if there is some in correspondence between that uh, registered by the supplier and the customer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this would be tackled immediately, and now they even control uh, the goods transferred so that it couldn't be uh, a matter to any uh, kind of fraud mm -hmm. uh, in the chain of mm -hmm. uh, supply. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, the origin of goods should comply, uh, sh the, the basic material sh should be at least of 70 percent of the final uh, product mm -hmm. so there are complications like that yeah we are really transparent to the state yeah. how we move and it's almost yeah. impossible now to yeah. uh, utilize and legitimate yeah the yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So really very very interesting <laughs> because for example in the Netherlands it's just you you make your own VAT return you file it and if the Dutch tax authorities have questions, of course, they ask questions and ask for invoice copy, the 10 highest invoices included in that return. They or they do an audit, but an open book like this is not the case yet. They no. Have very accurate data and data already on 15th uh, after the month's so, closing. So. Very transparent. And then you also need to supply it in a standard format. Yeah, sure. That's, uh, uh, that can be uploaded from the major accounting systems uh, yeah. automatically. Yeah. Uh, it's not too complicated, uh, but well, we are in continuous process of improvement of this system yeah. in the last yeah. two years. But it looks uh, like it's working really well. Okay. okay, great. Great to hear that. Interesting also. Any other countries who have this type of regulation already? Chat. I understood that Spain also implemented something like providing already invoices and information uh, very quickly. They introduced that in July uh, 1st, so a couple of days ago. So a lot of countries are already working on this. Is somebody from Brazil here? 
you know, because they ha also have the same type of system like Mexico has, uh, providing all this information to the authorities, and the authorities actually know everything then. And yeah, we, who knows, maybe in the EU that will be implemented that someday as well. Uh, that would make it a lot easier for the tax authorities at least. For companies it's a struggle. Because in the Ukraine, is it applicable to all companies? Uh, well, the threshold for Ukraine is 1 million uh, hryvnas, which is just about 35,000 euros. Ooh, yeah. And 12 subsequent months yeah. of turnover when you are obliged to get registered. And once you are registered, you are obliged to connect to this so, system of so. duty registration. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and then and moreover, you cannot manipulate with your account in that yeah. as well because Very we good. have to yeah. register VAT on the first of events for mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, once you have done all the filings with VAT, you cannot uh, adjust anything uh, okay. without a proper adjustment on the VAT system. So mm -hmm. corporate income tax is becoming more and more transparent of this. As well then, yeah. yeah. So yeah. they can manipulate to some extent with services yet, mm -hmm. but they, uh, I'm sure they will think of something as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. very good. Really very interesting to see that uh, a lot of countries already implemented something like that. We're waiting to see what will happen uh, in the rest of the world. Um, if a company is not compliant, it's there are risks involved. Um, and uh, so companies need to be aware of uh, to be fully compliant with the regulation. What could be the risk? These could be penalties. Penalties imposed on late registration, on late payment, etc., etc. Uh, interest could be charged by the authorities. Um, and also there could be non-recoverable VAT. Because if you receive an incorrect invoice, you do not notice it. You notice it after one year. Yeah, to go back to your supplier after one year, that could be a little bit very difficult. So then you also have VAT as a cost. That's also a risk for companies. What are opportunities? Because of course we would like to discuss these as well. Before you start doing business, make sure that you obtain advice from a VAT expert. What we often notice in practice is that everything already went wrong and then we come in and need to solve it. Uh, but uh, start in the beginning, it's more efficient and you can structure the flows most efficient, use these import VAD ferment license, etc., etc. Talk to the client where they should establish a warehouse or not, whatever they need to do. Also structure the business model, that it meets all the requirements, structure the administrative processes and put in place uh, operating procedures that will enable you to maximize refunds, cash flows, etc. Um, if you have implemented all this, what could be your advantage then that you ha can reclaim VAT, that you comply with the regulations, also for example that you apply a correct VAT rate. It could be worthwhile, worth, worthwhile to check whether for example a reduced VAT rate is applicable because if you're selling to consumers or if you're selling to a hospital who cannot reclaim VAT, it might be interesting that a lower VAT rate is applicable uh, to check that because then the costs for that customer will be lower. And if possible, that's also an interesting one, is um, apply uh, for the correct reporting period. In many countries, there are more different type of reporting period. So if, for example, you are in a payable position, that you file your VAT returns quarterly. But if you are in a refundable position, you file your VAT returns monthly because you want your VAT back quicker. If that's possible, apply for it. Are there any questions? You're very quiet. <laughs> I heard from Tom that you were very loud. <laughs> <laughs> well done, guys. You can go. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs>